everyone. So for our participants who are here, we'll be starting at around 4 p.m. So just a reminder for all our participants, um, please do not turn on your cameras and keep your microphones muted unless you are asked to unmute. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. We'll be starting in a bit. I'm Mayor Dupala Fox. Yeah. How are you? How are you, sir? <laughs> okay. 
So hello everyone. Um, it is now 4 p.m. So we can start. So thank you everyone for joining us here today. Uh, good afternoon everyone and thank you for your time for joining us in this webinar. I am Rita Galvez from the Habitat for Humanity, UP Diliman Campus Chapter. And this is Beyond the Concrete, a multi-sectoral approach on housing. So before starting, can we know where our different viewers are watching from? Um, please feel free to just send it on the chat. Like just send it on the chat address to everyone and we can just know where you guys are watching from so we have an idea. Oh, hello. Hi, Lester from Batangas. I see you. What about the others? Just feel free to keep on sending. Watching from Manila also. Also, um, just to mention, we also have some viewers here watching from Facebook Live. So for our Facebook Live viewers, just feel free to comment where you're watching from and just engage with us the whole time through comments. Wow, we have people from all over. We've got someone from Antipolo, someone from Manila, San Juan, Pasig City. Wow, guys, thank you so much for joining our webinar from all of these different places. Quezon City, yes. For me, uh, for me, I'm representing Makati City. Oh, we also have Pasay. Nice. So thank you, everyone. I see we have a pretty diverse audience today. So um, to introduce this event, this is the first ever youth-led online forum wherein we seek to harness different perspectives to raise awareness on the importance of decent shelter and empower you, our audience, to advocate for decent housing for all. So today, we are very privileged to have experts from the fields of local government, education, architecture and urban planning, and the nonprofit sector as panelists in this very timely discussion. So um, they will be sharing their experience, knowledge, and valuable insights in relation to housing advocacy to make an enriching forum that will inspire us all to build a world where everyone has a decent place to live in. So just a few reminders before we really start off. For everyone in Zoom, please remember to keep your videos off and to keep your microphones muted to avoid any technical difficulties. Also, if you might be experiencing any technical difficulties, please just log out and then log back in again. But when you log back in again, please ensure that your video is off. We also encourage everyone to switch to gallery view on Zoom to better be able to see all of our speakers. So for our panel discussion section that will happen a little bit later on, we will also be encouraging our Zoom audience to send in their questions to a co-host labeled questions. So if you look in the chat, you'll be able to find the questions co-host and that's who you should send the questions to later. So please take note, don't send it to everyone, send it to the questions co-host. And we are also live via Facebook and our viewers from Facebook will also have a chance to engage with us in our discussion and activities through just commenting them on our Facebook live stream. And then the team will relay it back to us so we can also know. All right. So to formally open our online forum and give us an overview on the housing advocacy and the work of Habitat for Humanity Philippines, we would like to introduce the president of the AXIA Group of Companies and the member of Habitat Philippines National Board of Trustees. Please welcome Mr. Paul Tanchi. Oh, Mr. Paul Tanchi, I, I'm afraid that you're muted. Oh, uh, sorry, Paul, I'm afraid that you're muted. There we go. I couldn't unmute myself. You oh. guys said uh, put, a, put a mute on us. But good afternoon, everyone. It's such a joy and privilege to, to be here with you this afternoon to talk about a housing. You know, housing is very close to my heart for many reasons, but the biggest by far is, you know, I myself am a father. I married the woman that I liked in high school. She, she's the only girlfriend I've ever had. And, I, and she became my girlfriend after college, if you believe that. And I have four children now. And I, I realized the importance of housing like many of you do. But let me tell you a story about Mary Grace Dalagon. She's a single mother of three kids. And you can put her picture up there on the screen. And she used to live in the flood prone area and always feared for their lives during the, the monsoon and typhoon season, relying only on the Pantawid Pal Palimyang Filipino program, the four piece. She struggled to fend for her children's daily needs. These difficulties did not crush her hopes 
that one day their life would turn around for the better. And slowly it did when she became a homeowner through the Habitat Philippines housing program in Silai. Having a safe and decent home, she made a small Sari Sari store in her living room that earns 300 pesos a day. She learned financial literacy, record keeping, and business inventory through the training conducted by Habitat Philippines. As a single mother, she can probably say that she's now building a life she wants for her children, safe, secure, stable, with endless opportunities for growth. Her home boosted her confidence that even in times of crisis, her family could bounce back easily. You know, Mary Grace is one of the more than 150,000 families that Habitat Philippines in the past 32 years has supported through safe and decent homes. Through partnerships with organizations, government, communities, individuals like you and me, we have assisted many families like Mary Grace to build strength and self-reliance through shelter. Guys, the, the need is so great. You know, the housing need is so great. According to the latest figure of the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development, the current housing backlog of our country is 6.75 million units. And the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has highlighted the extent of the housing crisis in the Philippines and globally. Even before the COVID-19 outbreak, millions of families were already struggling in inadequate, unhealthy housing. And as this pandemic continues, these families will face even more hardships due to the crisis, health, and economic fallouts. According to Habitat's Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter Commission study, the house building plans of 79% of households have been affected and that disrupted the whole housing value chain system. 52% of low income households fully stopped construction work while 18% don't have any plan to restart within the year. Due to the pandemic, 68% of the low income households have not been able to save anymore, which may dampen and has dampened the construction demand further. As I close up with the remarks, housing has become the frontline defense against the coronavirus and having a decent home has become a life or death situation. Now more than ever, we need to join together and address the urgent housing issues faced by millions of Filipino, millions of Filipinos. Housing is not an issue that can be solved by government or Habitat Philippines alone, nor the private sector, but together, we all can do our share to help build homes, one community at a time. Habitat is all about the love of Christ in action. So may God bless this first ever um, one of a kind uh, webinar and I'm excited to be part of this. Thank you for having me. God bless you all. Thank you so much as well, Mr. Paul Tanchi. That was really a wonderful speech. So actually, I wanted to share that this year is also a special time for us at Habitat for Humanity, as we're celebrating a decade of young leaders making a positive impact for housing through Habitat's largest youth movement, the Habitat Young Leaders Build, or HYLB, as we like to call it. So this webinar is actually one of the first activities for HYLB's 2021 kickoff. And the kickoff itself will happen on December 5, coinciding with the International Volunteer Day. So if anyone wants to know more about HYLB, we encourage you to visit the website shown on the screen or to follow the official social media pages and use the, and use the hashtags, hashtag HabitatYLB and Youth Legacy Builders. Moving on to give us a better idea on the country's housing crisis and what the youth can do in response to it, let's watch this short video.
Four million Filipino families live under bridges and in disaster-prone areas, facing every day without the stability and security that a safe home brings. My view on the housing problem in the Philippines is that it is a deep-rooted and a fundamental problem in our society. The lack of access to decent shelter hinders anyone from achieving decent livelihood and a decent standard of living. Social exclusion and physical and verbal abuse, among other problems that make it really difficult for them to create better lives for themselves. That's why it's so important to raise awareness of its complexities and gather support towards alleviating it. It is important to ensure the safety of each and every citizen by giving them the opportunity to have decent housing. Housing is so much more than building walls and putting a roof over a family's head. We need to work beyond that because providing homes also means that everyone within those walls feels safe and protected. Shelter is such a basic yet consequential need. Shelter in itself provides a lot of economic and social opportunities for these individuals and it allows them to pursue a decent livelihood and enjoy a decent life overall. The very first thing that I knew about Habitat for Humanity is that they built houses. And it was after I joined it that I realized that it was so much more than just the building houses part, that there was so much more to this advocacy of giving everyone a decent place to live in. I just knew that homelessness and indecent shelter are prominent issues in the Philippines and I wanted to learn more about what could be done to adjust this issue. I joined the Habitat because I love bringing people together. I believe that it is in this kind of thing that we can build better communities. Being able to contribute to the development of something as meaningful as a house was something I couldn't do anywhere else. And the teamwork involved in the whole process was nothing like I've ever encountered before. I really hope that through this webinar, we can bring other people into the conversation about housing. So in this way, I guess we plan to inspire others and maybe, maybe, maybe inspire them to be legacy builders. There's so much more to a community than the physical structure itself. And there's so much potential that we can harness from empowering and educating our communities for them to be able to build and shape their lives. I hope that more people understand the importance of decent and sustainable housing and that the negative stigma associated with those experiencing it gets broken down. Housing isn't just an engineering or an architectural issue, but it also involves a lot of sectors such as anthropology, sociology, and public policy. Big our collective efforts will surely amount to something great. So thank you so much for that wonderful video and also to our different youth leaders for just sharing their thoughts through that video. So like it was said in that video, we hope that everyone can take action and learn more through this webinar. So today we will delve deeper into housing through a collaborative insightful dialogue with our panel of experts. So um, for this discussion, we'll be asking questions which were collected during the registration period. So we asked registrants to send in their questions through there, as well as pre-collected questions and questions collected from our live audience today. So here are a few house rules and guidelines for a panel discussion. So should you have any questions for our panelists during the discussion, uh, please send them through the Zoom chat for our Zoom participants to the co-host there entitled questions. So if you look at the different options for the chat, you'll see that one of them is named questions. So we ask that that's where you send the questions, please, not to everyone. And then the team will be sending some of your chosen questions over to the moderator or me so that I can ask our panelists. And then depending on the question, it is possible that I may ask some participants to unmute, unmute themselves so that they can further expound on what they ask. If this happens, please remember to keep your video off to avoid any technical difficulties. We also encourage everyone here on Zoom to switch to gallery view to be able to better see all of our speakers. Finally, for our participants watching through Facebook Live, you can also send in your questions and join our activities. You can do this by typing them on the Facebook Live comment section, and we have a team member there who will collect them and also send them over to me to ask. So, 
for a much-awaited panel discussion. Finally, guys, we're in the panel discussion. We have five panelists joining us to share their thoughts and ideas on housing. So first off, we would like to introduce Ms. Aryan Aligayu. She is the Strategic Support Manager of Habitat for Humanity Philippines, and she will be sharing her insights on how organizations can take part in the mission to provide decent shelter for everyone and give us a better understanding of how decent housing can impact lives. So please give everyone a wave, Ms. Aligayu. <laughs> so next we have Ms. Paulette Liu. Senior Vice President for Human Resources and Administration of the Primary Group of Builders, which provides training to construction workers in the Southern Philippines. She will highlight the importance of proper education and skills development for sustainable housing. So please give us a wave, Ms. Liu. <laughs> Hello, Ms. Liu. So our third panelist is Dr. Mary Rosales, a professor in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology at the Ateneo de Manila University. With her vast experience in working with NGOs and supporting community groups, she will highlight the importance of creating an environment for social solidarity towards raising the housing advocacy. Please give us a wave, Dr. Rosales. So our fourth panelist is architect Felino Palafox Jr., the principal architect urban planner and founder of Palafox Associates, as well as the president and founder of Palafox, Palafox Architecture Group. He will give insights on developing construction plans, frameworks, and designs to provide inclusive, sustainable, affordable housing for the less privileged. Please give us a wave, Mr. Uh, architect Palafox. Yeah, it's my turn now. Oh, no, just give us a wave, Paul. There we yeah. <laughs> Hello, Paul. And finally, we have Valenzuela City Mayor Rex Cachalian, who has taken the lead in various housing and urban development projects, most notably the Disciplina Village project. His participation today will help emphasize the role of leaders in developing sustainable communities and mobilizing people to be part of the solution. So please give us a wave, Mayor Cachalian. Hello, Paul. So, wow. <laughs> So I guess it's incredibly exciting to see all of the amazing panelists that we have for this discussion. And we also have a list of very interesting questions lined up, pre-prepared by us and collected from you. So thank you to everyone who also sent in their questions. So we have divided our pre-collected questions into five sections to better facilitate this panel discussion. We have an introductory section, followed by a discussion on the relation of housing to well-being. This will be then followed by a discussion on community development, education, and empowerment, then a discussion on the overall impact on housing. So for our audience, please again, don't hesitate to send in your question through the panel discussion by personally messaging them to the questions co-host on the Zoom chat, or if you're watching through Facebook Live by commenting them on Facebook. So without further ado, let's begin with our first section, which is our introductory section. So for this section, we have actually asked all of our speakers to answer the following questions for their introduction. One is what got you interested in housing? Two is can you share with us some projects and experiences that involve housing? And three is what do you believe is the biggest struggle when it comes to the housing issue? So perhaps for this, we can start with Ms. Ariane Aligayu. Thank you, Rita. Good afternoon, everyone. My internet is a bit unstable, so hopefully I don't get cut off. <laughs> so my involvement with the housing NGO Habitat for Humanity started with the Jimmy Carter Work Project in 1999. It's a build event of Habitat International led by the former US President Jimmy Carter. It was the first time that the build was held in Asia and Habitat Philippines was hosting it. This was done for five consecutive days where people from all walks of lives local international volunteers, donors, partners, and even home partner beneficiaries came together to build and complete the construction of houses. At the site where I was assigned, we finished the construction of 99 houses in five days. So my experience in that activity, the energy, the sense of accomplishment, and the feeling that you're making a difference made me want to be part of this cause. Habitat for Humanity has a bold vision, a world where everyone has a decent place to live. It's a very daunting task. And we recognize that we cannot attain this goal on our own. Habitat has worked toward, worked toward this goal using network of volunteers, partners, and funders to build, renovate, and repair houses to serve families in need nationwide. This is what Habitat's mission is about, bringing people together to build homes, communities, and hope. 
Right now, Habitat is present and operating in Cebu, Leyte, Negros Occidental, Davao, and NCR. Our, our biggest project is the Negros Occidental Impact 2025, where we target to build 10,000 homes in the province of Negros in the next five years in partnership with the LGUs, the private developers, and corporate funders. Target families for this project are the informal settler families and low-income households in the province. The houses being built here are um, use cement bamboo frame technology. But aside from building new houses, Habitat is striving to reach scale and enable more families focused in um, have access to improved shelter. So through our Terwilliger Center for Innovation and Shelter, it focuses on creating innovative solutions that lead to better housing for low-income households by partnering with microfinance institutions to include housing loans in their products and by supporting local firms to expand and make their product more responsive to low-income households. So when asked about one of our major challenges in terms of housing, could say that affordability remains the nation's growing housing challenge. The lack of access to affordable housing and land is the reason why the poorest residents are found living in hillsides, railroad tracks, waste dumps, and in densely packed informal settlements. Government's role in providing quality housing is limited. So for the past years, the national, national budget allocation for housing has been decreasing despite the massive housing backlog. As mentioned by Paul earlier, issued our uh, Department of Human Settlement and Urban Development estimates that the current backlog stood at 6.7 million units. This figure covers only households that can afford housing that costs 480,000 and above. In the study commissioned by Habitat, uh, the housing back, uh, uh, Ms. Ayan? On housing backlog, focusing on the unserved segment in the housing market, when we talk about the S, yes, Rita. Oh, nothing, Paul. Sorry, you just uh, cut off for a while, but continue on, Paul. Thank you, Paul. So if there's no drastic action that will be done, by 2022, we'll have about 15 million units that we need to build. So as is stated in the study, policy direction of the government related to housing does not directly address the unserved segment who are most vulnerable to disaster, diseases, and emergencies, nor the, back, the housing backlog. So the performance of both government and private sector are inadequate to address the housing needs of the Filipino families. So what is needed right now are thoughtful policies aimed at achieving different solutions for households at different income levels and expanding land and housing opportunities for all. Thank you, Rita. All right. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Ariana Ligayu. That was really very insightful. So thank you for sharing all of that with us. Um, next, we can move on to Ms. Paulette Liu. Hi, greetings from Cebu. I'd like to start off with a story. Now, before Typhoon Rolly and Ulysses, there was Typhoon Yolanda that hit Visayas in 2013. Can I move my slide, please, to the next one? Okay. It was a Category 5 cyclone destroyed 1.1 million homes, disrupted 5.9 million jobs, and over 6,000 lives gone. Next slide, please. Weeks after Yolanda, I visited Bugo. It's a small coastal city in the northern part of Cebu. Um, there I met Juan. Juan lost his house and was rebuilding a new shelter for his family using the salvage materials and the natal galvanized iron roofing. I asked how he was able to build his shelter from scratch, and his reply was simple. All oh, building repairing my home is born out of necessity because I don't have the money to pay for labor and buy new materials. Skilled construction workers are also hard to find in my area. I admired Juan's resilience. Next slide, please. In the face of adversity, the Filipino bounces back in the best way he can. But will his house match his resilience? After seeing the house he built, I knew it could not withstand another typhoon. The roof was not securely fastened to its wooden trusses. 
The footings are not rooted in the ground. Exposed trusses and lack of ceiling enables the rain to penetrate the house. Poor workmanship. Next slide, please. Substandard materials. Lack of skilled workers who can help build and maintain strong, resilient houses. And lack of sufficient financing are housing problems that continue to hound millions of Filipino families. Before the pandemic, it was estimated that 17 million Filipinos are living in poverty. Hence, buying or building a house is simply impossible. Next slide, please. I am very privileged to be here today among our country's youth leaders and distinguished panelists to share our advocacy on how we can sustainably close our country's huge housing gap. Our organization is called the Primary Group of Builders. It's a Cebu-based conglomerate that operates businesses in the fields of construction, real estate, shipping, logistics, manufacturing, lifestyle and medical services, and human capital development. In 2008, next slide, please. We established a foundation. It's a technical vocational institute called Skills, or the School of Knowledge for Industrial Labor, Leadership, and Service to address the lack of skilled workforce in the construction industry to address the mismatch between academic and industry requirements and widespread poverty due to unemployment. Our mission is to train and certify globally competent Filipino workers. Through the years, next slide please. We've trained, assessed and facilitated the employment of 20,000 marginalized Filipinos. These are unemployed women and men, out of school youth and persons with disabilities, particularly the hearing impaired. Next slide please. Skills is a standalone senior high and is a technical vocational institute that challenged the status quo by advocating gender equality with the inclusion of women in a male dominated industry such as construction. We train them as heavy equipment and crane operators, carpenters, masons, and handy women, empowering and inspiring positive change. Next slide, please. So how can we promote affordable, accessible, and safe housing? Next slide, please. In 2016, the K-12 Plus project was piloted. It's a senior high school model that would prepare them for employment and entrepreneurship. It was a collaboration involving the government, industry, and academe, and supported by efforts from the German Federal Ministry and Cebu Chamber of Commerce. The collaboration resulted in an industry certification program called the ACAS. Next slide, next slide please. Called the ACAS, or Assessment Certification and Accreditation System. Next slide, next slide, please. Okay, our advocacy ACAS ensures the standardization of competencies to address the construction industry's clamor for more skilled workers, vis-a-vis -vis the struggle of millions of Filipinos to get decent, well-paid, and sustainable employment. We bundled four different skills. These are TESTA NC2s in carpentry, masonry, tile setting, and plumbing, and created a job profile called the Builder System. As builder assistant, he adds more value to the projects at elevating his dignity and financial sustainability that previously eluded generation of construction workers. Next slide, please. If you train more who wants to become certified builder assistants, we are all not only providing more decent, sustainable jobs with higher financial rewards, but we are also increasing the pool of construction professionals able to build and maintain safe, disaster resilient houses. Today, the last slide, please. Amid the coronavirus pandemic, decent housing becomes more important as it is now a place for study, work, and protection from the threats of the coronavirus. We need to protect each family, Filipino family, by giving them the opportunity to acquire better houses. Industry certification ensures that families have access to skilled construction professionals. Being certified provides jobs that enable families to acquire the affordable, accessible, safe, and quality shelter. And as builder assistants, they are self-determined, empowered professionals who are able to command their lives and hope for a better future. As skills forges ahead with our industry certification advocacy, we are ultimately built, building better homes and stronger families. We are also building better lives. Thank you. Thank you so much as well, Ms. Paulette Liu. And that's a wonderful message as well, that let us not just build homes, but build better lives. So moving on, um, Dr. Mary Rosales, may we hear from you, Po? Oh, uh, you muted, Po. <laughs> yes, uh, good afternoon. What got me into housing 
You know, it all started because as a social anthropologist, uh, just out of my finish to the master's degree from UP, uh, I joined the Institute of Philippine Culture, Ateneo, and I was assigned to do a study in Tondo. But this was not the Tondo foreshore, not the informal settlements part, but a low income neighborhood. We wanted to show that cities or, you know, are not what uh, often abroad I learned as an undergraduate were secular, were uh, impersonal and so on. And we wanted to see was that the case as Manila was urbanizing more. And so we started with a um, community in Vitas area, a low income neighborhood, not informal settlers. And so I did an ethnography there and I began to publish a lot. And um, then one day, not long after, a group of community organizers um, from the Tondo foreshore informal settlement came to see me and they said, you know, we really appreciate that you are showing the positive side of, the, of poor people and that they're ordinary people who are struggling to make a life in the city for their children to have a future and so on. Uh, that is not the image that urban informal settlements have. In fact, at the time they were very negatively dubbed as squatters, right? Seen as uh, uh, areas of uh, uh, drugs and, and prostitution, all the negative stereotypes. Uh, but the organizers had gone into the foreshore to enable people to get organized and deal with their housing needs, okay? Now that meant housing, not even at the beginning as houses, construction, you know? it meant access to security of tenure. And that is a standard problem that all informal settlers have, you know, the one third or so who are still, or a little bit less now, um, informal settlers in Metro Manila. The, their issue is not immediately a house. Their issue is tenure, security of tenure and the right to remain, the right not to be evicted, to some distant place where they cannot survive. And the evidence, despite all the government programs that have forced uh, that kind of approach out of city resettlement with no jobs available, et cetera, um, they, from the beginning, the Tondo Foreshore Group, who was being organized by NGO community organizers, said, no, we want to remain here. And they really fought, struggled to make that happen. The organizers were, um, you know, people who didn't believe in violence. So it's organized, people power, nonviolent. So just to, you know, when I, when they invited me, I said, well, what can I do there? They said, just come, come to the meetings, listen to what people say as they struggle through how they can remain on site despite, and this is martial law, huh? This was still the uh, Marcos uh, government. So, operating as a community organizer in that context, it was really very questionable from the government point of view. But those of us who were organizers and I, as a social anthropologist, beginning to look at the patterns, saw that, my goodness, they are winning little, you know, forward struggles back and forth, negotiating with the government. To make a long story short, uh, they actually got the right to stay. They almost forced government to agree uh, with the support of the World Bank, because the World Bank was the one that had originally been uh, asked to fund the relocation. And when people held firm, said, we don't want to move, we are better off here for all the reasons we know now, we're a lot of very sensible, uh, got in touch with uh, NGOs who lobby with the World Bank in Washington to support their concern. You know, there was an enormous effort to justify their demand really to stay on site because they wanted to be uh, the ordinary families working for a future and they knew they could do that there. They had already built up a sense of community unity through community organizing that enabled them to help one another. Government at that time didn't want to support them at all. Didn't even want to give more than minimal water because they said, you know, squatters, if you give them access to anything material, they're going to stay. We want them out. That whole orientation, fortunately, has changed tremendously owing to the people's efforts, to NGOs, to church-based groups, to associations like, you know, a Habitat for Humanity. That whole orientation has changed government also. 
So that the understanding that poor people um, want to have a place where their families can thrive and have a future. All right, so just, just to end that, let me say, I got into this, not as housing, right? If, if you think of housing in the narrow sense of a house, because at the time and still today, many planners think that the problem of the urban poor is they need a better house. Of course they need a better house, but first they need security of tenure. They need to recognize that they have a right to be there. They can build communities and, and access to work, all right? So that's the context, the much larger context, which I have been involved with ever since uh, and have seen tremendous developments, very positive, still many negative, but it's a struggle that people have themselves taken on with the help of many of the middle level support groups like yourselves. That's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosales. And that's true. The housing problem is really a wide one and there are so many factors that go into it. So next, may we ask architect uh, Felino Palafox Jr. to share his thoughts. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share. And for me, housing is complete communities, place to live, work, shop, dine, learn, and worship, and with some uh, health care and wellness centers, and mixed income, and cross-generational. This pandemic is, uh, as Churchill said, never let a good crisis go away. So we have to learn uh, and learn some mistakes and, uh, uh, and borrow some best practices in the world. And uh, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Mary Raselis that, that the urban poor should be as much pra practicable. Option number one is on site. Option number two is near the site. Option number three, when you relocate, it should be a complete community, again, place to live, work, shop, dine, learn, and so on. And in 1976, I was team leader for Metroplan, World Bank funded. And we, we designed a new township, master plan, it's somewhere in Molino, when it was only 20 centavos per square meter. And we asked government that new township should be 30% for the urban poor or socialized housing. And the open market housing, the, where they make profits, cross-subsidized, the socialized urban poor housing, so they are part of the community. Not many people know that in Ayala Labang, there are seven districts, and district number number two, uh, district two was uh, was uh, employee housing. Again, there's a form of uh, cross subsidy. I, I was the master planner for Cebu Business Park, so we did also uh, employee housing for the urban poor, complete community as well. And uh, elsewhere in the Philippines, like the Esteros. Uh, uh, or the Pasig River, we designed green architecture for the poor. Three stories, the ground floor is for livelihood or tricycle party with vertical vegetable gardens like Ampalaya and so on. So again, livelihood is there. And uh, I've also worked on, on uh, uh, in, in, for indigenous people in Tarlac. Again, complete communities. Smoky Mountain, we designed a multi-story uh, like a condo for, for the urban poor. And the ground floor would just be open. So it's open space and also it gets flooded. It would just be there. Chuchi organization, the Buddhist organization in Taiwan, asked me, we Filipinos should clean up Smoky Mountain first and they would they would fund the, the urban poor housing. And also in, in Mumbai, uh, Mumbai in, in India, we, we the the shanties, the shanties of the of the poor in, in Mumbai, 32,000 of them were uh, we recommended they should be demolished and make vertical housing in Singapore so they have more open spaces. And again, what should be in a community? Schools, place of worship, and, and livelihood. And also, in uh, I was an urban planner for Dubai. And one of the things that I was assigned to was housing for the workers who are from 200 nationalities. And so housing for the, for a, uh, indigenous people of Dubai, the Bedouins, again, complete the uh, communities. And, and in, our, in our country, I think in the metropolitan areas, we cannot be doing urban sprawl because it's scarce land resources. We should go vertical now, a la Singapore. So we can also include what should be in the community and more open spaces also. In, in Boston, the principle of cross-subsidy the like the 
the government of Massachusetts for every housing community, 10% for the should be the poor, for the poor. And there's a principle of cross subsidy. So the poor as part of the community. And the Archdiocese of Boston, 20% for the poor. So uh, again, a principle of, of cross subsidy. And and again, the 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 uh, uh, what do you call this? The re relocation program that uh, that is being done since the 70s is not actually humane because they only re relocated the urban poor. But in the community, there are also welfare uh, parts of uh, members of the community. The so urban poor were the uh, banderas of the uh, the welfare people in Tondo, and the the jeepney drivers and the laundry women were relocated as far as possible, Sapangpala and Carmona at that time. And their husbands kept coming back, the jeepney drivers, taxi drivers, and it's also a social problem because they created second families and so on. So for me, housing is uh, the Greek word, echistics. It's the art and science of human settlements. And I think housing is not just shelter. In fact, uh, Lee Kuan Yew of uh, Singapore when some architects in Singapore, they complained to him, how come Singapore did not have cultural centers and so on? And Lee Kuan Yew said, we'll do the cultural centers only after every Singaporean has a roof above his head. 82% of uh, Singaporeans are public housing, vertical public housing. So we have a lot to learn. And during this pandemic, it's also awakened us. The, squad, the informal settlers shanties, nine square meters with five family members. So less than two square meters per person. How can they have social, how, social distancing, physical distancing? And, and maybe I'm at fault also because many of my clients are the urban rich. And some of the homes of the urban rich, uh, 100, 200, 300, and even 500 square meters per person compared to the less than two square meters per person in our informal settlers, urban poor people. And, it, and in fact, even in, the, in our codes, it's so only two bedrooms. And the, the housing we're doing for funded by Chuchi, the Buddhist organization, at least three bedrooms so that sisters and brothers don't share the same, uh, the same room. And it's through that three school. And, and again, Chuchi, funded our work for 11 public schools in Bam, Iran, after the big earthquake, public schools near uh, in the urban poor areas. And the public school we designed is for earthquake intensity 10 or an earthquake that never happened. And, uh, and our building called the Philippines is only intensity seven. And then after the big earthquake in, in Kathmandu, Nepal, again, in the poor uh, urban poor areas, we were appointed to do a, a, a university, three schools, and hospitals that will last 40 generations, 1,000 years. And in our country, uh, Yolanda, we designed the transient homes, uh, temporary homes for the victims of Yolanda. And now, again, Chuchi organization headquarters in, 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 tai, in Taiwan, they appointed us again to do permanent homes for the victims of Yolanda in Palo Leite. And the permanent homes we're doing now are three stories so that we accommodate more Filipinos, more, more victims of Yolanda, and also they have their livelihood centers, community centers, uh, place of worship, and so on. And, and these are lessons learned that uh, we can share. So, so we, we should not continue to have the relocation uh, very far from their uh, existing communities. And one more thing, we are we have substandard stand, uh, standard uh, codes for uh, for for the urban poor. We have the smallest uh, code for the size of the uh, urban poor area. African countries are even better than our standard for the urban poor. Anyway, thank you very much for opportunity to share, and I hope we'll have more conversation. And one more thing. 8,000 hectares of urban land in Metro Manila are vacant. And many government offices, they have spare land. And, and, and again, for, for, the, for the 
uh, areas liable to disasters. Again, in the Metro Plan Manila project, uh, World Bank funded, we said that time areas, stress areas liable to flooding and other disasters. Uh, we should control development until the necessary infrastructure is put in place, like dredging, dredging of Laguna Lake, the Paranaque Spillway. And I told the public people, there was a hearing in, in the Senate uh, last Wednesday, chaired by Manny Pacquiao, as chairman of the Public Works Committee. So we had engineers from Public Works, they only proposing a solution to flooding is hard infrastructure or great infrastructure, uh, uh, concrete, concrete, concrete. So I told them there is also green infrastructure. First, we must reforest the denuded mountains in Sierra Madre Mountains and Marquina Watershed and Laguna Lake Watershed. And let's, uh, another green infrastructure, let's not just protect the mangroves, we should even enhance them. So public works engineers is only looking at the engineering the gray infrastructure, concrete infrastructure, which is not enough. And good news, there's already a master plan for, uh, for, for flood and drainage in Metro Manila. Bad news, it will be completed in 2035. So what do, do we do now? What do we do now? So we had proposed adaptive architecture and adaptive engineering. So these areas liable to flooding, maybe government can do uh, uh, elevated walkways, at least there will be refuge areas during floods, higher than the flood line. Like Marikina had, after Ondoy, 19 meters high of flooding. So no livable space, spaces should be below 19, 19 meters. Otherwise, uh, we'll keep uh, flooding. And I, I've been telling government, there are 18 kinds of disasters, 10 man-made and oh, eight sorry, natural. Yeah. So we should sorry, address the hazards before they become disasters. Okay, thank you. Sorry, Pa. Sorry, it went a bit over time lang po. But thank you so much for all those thank wonderful you. thoughts, Mr. Palafox. Um, may we move on na po to Mayor Rex Gachalian, if you would like to share some thoughts with us? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, Valenzuela's story, I guess, with housing is something that we're very proud of because it's a Galing Po Awardee. It's called Disciplina Village. Actually, we have three of these Disciplina Villages. And they are uh, cumulatively, by the time we're done with construction in all three of them, we would be housing 10,000 uh, families who used to live in danger zones, uh, riverbanks, under transmission lines. By 2022 or even by next year, we can tell people that we will be the first city in Metro Manila or in the country, as a matter of fact, that has zero informal settlers in any of our public domains or danger zones, meaning no families living beside sidewalks, no families living beside roadsides, uh, beside riverbanks. Now, what's so different and peculiar about Disciplina Village that garnered us this recognition by Galing Po? Um, number one, uh, we only do in-city relocation. We studied the models of the past governments and wherein they would ship out informal sector residents to the provinces only to find out that they came back to the cities. In Valenzuela, no. All our residents will stay in-city and all our relocations areas, which we refuse to call them relocation areas, we call them townships, uh, are all in metro inside the city proper. That means they have access to their families, they have access to work, they, you are not uprooting them totally out of their comfort zones. Now, our discipline of villages ranges from 11 hectares to the smallest at two hectares. Uh, like I said, we have three that are almost done, two more in the pipeline for next year. Another distinct feature of Disciplina Village is it's a complete township. Uh, Architect Palafox was mentioning it a while ago. We learned early enough that when you're moving in people into a community to make them stay there, you have to make it palatable and acceptable to them. So we created integrated townships. This one you're seeing is the biggest one of them. It comes with its own high school, its own elementary, its own police station, its own mini city hall, its own health center, multiple daycare centers, playgrounds, basketball courts. The theory there is whatever they see in a middle-class subdivision brochure should be for them to experience. Um, we also realize that you can't be moving people to half-baked houses. These housing units, when they come in, will also have power and electricity built into it already. They range from 22 square, kit, square meters to around 34, if I'm not mistaken, all lawful, lawful. And the community township has its own supermarket, 
terminal malls that are in PPP, meaning we took in private investors to invest in the commercial establishments inside. Now, another salient feature of Disciplina Village is they're all public rental in nature. We learned early enough that when in the prior NHA housing projects, when you would give the title immediately to the person without a reorientation in their mindset, they come into trouble because money is always an issue. And the first thing they, they would use as collateral for loans would be the housing title. And lo and behold, that same unit that was granted to them would pass on multiple hands because money is always scarce. And they'll find themselves living in the same informal, uh, informal areas that they used to live in. So sabi ko nga, ang unang sinasanla sa mga nagpa-5-6 normally yung titulo. But in Disciplina Village, because it's public rental, they, may, they are made to sign a perpetual use contract. They can't sell that contract and it's only exclusively for their family's use. Um, those contracts are perpetual in nature, governed by a city ordinance. They only pay 300 pesos, so it's fully subsidized by the local government. And also, um, they are governed by rules. See, we want to change their mindset from informal settlers or squatters to responsible homeowners. So when they move into Disciplina Village, they are given a handbook wherein there are the tenements of a being a basic homeowner, meaning these are rules such as bawal yung nakahubad, you can't do karaoke in the hallway. We want to maintain that, uh, we want to maintain the order and the sense of community in our townships. Um, again, um, how did we do this? No, You would probably wonder, why would we have such big vast of tracts of land in Venezuela? We actually don't. What the local government did was to expropriate idle property in the city. We figured that if you're not going to use your land, it's let, let's, let, let's make the greater public, especially those unfortunate Venezuelanos, use the land. So we expropriated it, used political will uh, to make sure that we got hold of those, those land, partnered up with different agencies to build those homes. Uh, for our first Disciplina Village, it was National Housing Authority together with GK. In our second community, which is the bigger one, it's uh, National Housing Authority. And in our third community, it's GK and NGCP or the Transco that finance the buildings. The local government builds the common facilities, thus the master planning owns the land, but the structures themselves are financed by national government agencies like NHA or private agencies like NG private corporations like NGCP. Bottom line, again, bragging rights of Valenzuela, by as early as next summer, we will be the only city in Metro Manila or the whole country that does not have informal settlers living in any of our danger zones or public work sites. So thank you for having me again. So I guess I beat the timeline <laughs> given to me. All right, thank you so much as well, Mayor Rex Gachalian. So that was very wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. I'm sure that a lot of people were able to get wonderful insights from it. So um, thank you to all our speakers for those wonderful introductions. Uh, we feel like we've learned so much more about housing already. So before we start with our second section, which will start our more interactive sections, we wanted the audience to send in their answers to the following questions to the chat. So for this one, please address your answer, your I mean, your answers to this question to everyone. So not to the questions co-host, but to everyone, so that everyone can see it. So um, please send in your answers to the question, what does home mean to you? So just feel free to send them in. Our speakers can also send them into the chat if you would like. Family, that's true. I feel that way as well. Somebody has also answered that home means safety. That's wonderful. Oh, for our Facebook Live viewers, feel free to answer this question through the comment section as well. Home is also comfort and security. These are all wonderful answers. Thank you, everybody. So with that, let's move on to our second section. So for our second section, we will be tackling questions on the relation of housing to well-being. So please remember now to address your questions to the questions co-host and not to everyone. If you're on Zoom, if you're on Facebook, please just comment them on the comment section and then um, a member from our team will send them over to us. So our first question to um, kind of jump off from the discussion on disaster resilience. We wanted to ask our speakers, how feasible do you think disaster resilient housing is, especially for those with limited resources? So would anyone like to start this off here? Uh, Mayor Rex Cachalian, go ahead. Bob. 
Well, uh, from the Valenzuela experience, it can be done. Uh, you just have to use the immense power that's given to government to work on it. Uh, in the case of Venezuela, I kept on harping on zero informal settlers in our danger zones. Uh, these are riverbanks, creekside, canals, uh, sidewalks, under the transmission line. Uh, like I said, by n- summer of next year, all the way to summer of 2022, we will have zero informal settlers living in any of these danger zones. Uh, I might have a different take on it, wherein uh, rather than me restructuring their houses, I would just move them to safer grounds. So you cities like Valenzuela, we have geohazard maps. We know where the safe areas are. And that's where we located our Disciplina villages. We had wanted to make sure that um, they are literally away from harm's way. And given that it's in city, it's very palatable for them. They won't mind le- leaving the danger site, which you know they're always fearing when the water rises, they start evacuating. Now they're located in uplands of Valenzuela or inner parts of the city that are flood free, uh, that are actually well aerated and ventilated because they have urban gardens inside. We've been working with uh, BIFAR on creating urban gardens. So it can be done. Uh, I guess my paradigm is just, I mean, not changing the house structure, but rather moving them out of harm's way. Thank you so much for that, Mayor Gachalian. Um, I think, Ms. Paulette, you, you would also like to share some of your thoughts on yes. this. Uh, there is a challenge as Filipinos are more accustomed to incremental housing development. Oftentimes, the households would opt to use substandard housing materials. Construction is not supported by building plans. And there is a high reliance on cheap but unskilled labor. However, we're not saying it's not possible. Disaster resilient housing would still be possible if more developers with the support of the government would invest in housing for the low cost market, encourage financing and provide for unbanked Filipinos as well as creating more incentives to the developers. All right. Thank you so much for that as well, Ms. Liu. I think Ms. Ariana Liga, you would also like to share some thoughts on this. Oh, Ms. Ariana, okay. I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah. Yes, I agree with Mayor Gacheliano. I think the ultimate um, intervention that should be done is to relocate people from the danger zones. But if it's not possible, because there are, re- like, you know, Philippines is really, you know, prone to calamities, typhoon, flooding. But if it's not possible to relocate them, of course, we need to come up with, you know, retrofitting for these houses. After the typhoon Yolanda, we've been hearing a lot about build back better, meaning, you know, you don't just build back what was destroyed, but you have to make your adjust, make adjustment in your structure so that you'll be able to be more uh, disaster uh, resilient. But then, Basically, it boils down to political will of our uh, local government uh, units and even our national government to really make sure that all Filipinos would, you know, houses of all Filipinos will be disaster resilient. All right. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Ariane. So that was a wonderful discussion on this question. Moving on, uh, our next question is actually related to this one. Uh, we wanted to ask, how can people from different backgrounds, rich or poor, have the same level of stability or sense of safety during these crises. So this is the disaster crisis as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. So would any of our speakers like to share some thoughts on this? Okay, so um, if ever, may I call uh, Dr. Mary Rosales. Would you have any thoughts that you would like to share on this? Okay, if you say, you know, mi- mixing, mixing up people is, can also be very difficult because um, although I know it's been done and we should really check what happens when, when you have a mixture, as was I think um, uh, architect Paul Fuchs was saying, he has experience that 10% or 20% are allocated to the worker uh, groups, not really informal settlers mostly, but worker groups of companies, of the families living in the other 80%. You know, do we have evidence of what works? You know, how does that happen? Um, I, I don't know if I'm really answering your question. I, if I can go, I actually, I'd like to go back to something I wanted to ask Mayor Gachalian, if you don't mind. Can I do that? Yeah. All right, Paul, go ahead. Okay. Uh, you know, I know much of the anxieties that people have when they're forced, when they feel they might have to move. And the Valenzuela example, uh, you know, the Disciplina Village, of course, is a really outstanding. But I know I, I wanted to ask you, 
I know that the average Filipino urban poor, especially set, uh, informal settlers, is, is very concerned about the tenure issue. In other words, have you had the experience then that your renters want to use their rental as a kind of a down payment so that maybe in 10 years they can own the apartment? Because then we know that they will really take care of their surroundings, et cetera, et cetera. I think you know that too. So I wonder what's your experience with that? When they okay. say to you, we want to own this, how do you respond? All right, two things. Um, not only do they say that to us, but rather it's always a political issue every three years when I run for the election. Remember, it's such a popular thing for my opponent to go on stage and say, pag ako naging mayor, ibibigay ko sa inyo lahat yan. So obviously, people will start clapping while me, I'll go stand on stage and say, we'll continue this model. See, ma'am, I really believe that we have to look at the, the historic perspective. Uh, not to disparage our government agencies, but the prior experience of socialized housing or national housing authority were in lipat ng tao, bigay ka agad ng titulo. We have two NHA communities here done by the last administration. Lo and behold, the, of the 100% pie of original dwellers, only 20% are original ones. The other 80% nasanla na, na po na nasanla yung titulo. Because like I said, when, uh, sh forgive the lingo, when shit hits the fan, the easiest thing to put as collateral will be that title. So the same families that were beneficiaries are now back in wherever they used to be, renting uh, in beside the railway that they used to occupy. They just went back. So we had to relocate, re relocate them again. Bottom line, poverty can't be, the mindset of being an informal settler has to change over time. So what we're saying is in Disciplina Village, yes, the day will come that you might own this structure, but for now we have to train you. Remember I said that there are handbooks. They're made to attend responsible owners' seminars or else you literally get kicked out of the community uh, if you don't follow the rules. That's why it's called discipline. We want to somehow gradually change their mindsets. Not, they're not informal settlers anymore, but rather they're responsible homeowners. And the day that they become responsible homeowners will be the day that they start. we start talking about um, giving those units to them. Number two. We never envision Disciplina Village to be the end of it all. We would always tell them, look, this is a transitory housing for you. Buelo huto eh. This is a lifeline given to you. Now, because it's only 300 pesos perpetually, you'll be able to set up saving accounts where you can start saving for your future home that you will buy outside Disciplina Village. Or you may, the parents might end up dying in Disciplina Village, but the next generation will have that house we're in they own it. They were bought, bought by their hard-earned money that they were able to accumulate because the rent in Disciplina Village is such a cheap rent. So bottom line, what we're saying is we don't envision you to live in socialized housing forever. We have to aspire for something better. And in order to do that, we have to give them the lifeline. Give them that tawag namin doon yung buelo. The, the, the fallback that for the next, let's say, 10 years, at 300 pesos a month, you'll be able to save Kasi ang rental ngayon sa informal settlers community in the riverbanks, you bed space for 2,500 pesos or 3,000 pesos. They're made to pay uh, hooligans who claim that those properties are theirs. So with 300 pesos, you're saving already 2,700 pesos daily. Also, because all the common facilities are in walking distance because they're townships, you also save on transportation costs. And the factories are literally outside these disciplina villages, so you don't have to really commute anymore. And sum it all up, you'll have a savings account. That's why we make them attend save, uh, savings or financial management classes, working with local co-ops, so that they can build their financial capacity to start investing in that dream home that they want for themselves or for their kids. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rosales. Um, I think Ms. Ayan would also like to say something, but if ever, yeah. we might move on for after okay. this speech. Very short, but I, I like the idea that uh, Mayor Gachalian uh, raised, you know, that this house, the, the Sipina village, is just like a transitionary housing for families because later on, hopefully, you know, they will improve their lives and then they can buy houses outside the Sipina village. I think that's what we wanted to have no for our for the Filipino families like different stages of responses for the different needs of families. Thank you. Okay, all right. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Ayan.
So actually, um, I think that we have a question here from one of our audiences. Um, hold on, let me just read this out. From Lester Ilau, he wanted to ask that a lot of organizations around the world are exploring the use of bamboo as a sustainable, low-cost building material. I believe the Philippines is abundant in bamboo, but I rarely see organizations that promote this material for use in housing projects. What are your views on the matter? So perhaps for this, if nobody would like to raise their hand, we can ask um, architect Palafox, would you have um, a response to it? Yeah, I agree. Bamboo is a good uh, building material. In fact, it's a sustainable building material. And even with this virus, it's easier to clean and so on. And, and as, uh, we can, bamboo, you can make, use it as a building material after five years. Unlike timber, you have to wait maybe 60 years to use it for, for building material. So it's more sustainable uh, building material. And it's flexible. It's, even for earthquakes, it, it's better. All right. Thank you so much for that, Architect Falapo. So again, for our audience, just keep on sending in your questions. We really appreciate it. Unfortunately, though, we won't be able to ask all the questions you send in. So we're just picking a few. Um, Ms. Ayan, you would like to share something as well? Sorry, I just want to share that, you know, our Negros Occidental project, the Negros Impact 2025, the houses that we were building in the, in the province, we use um, bamboo, uh, cement, cement bamboo uh, frame technology. So that's what we are advocating also. Hopefully it will be, um, you know, the, the mm -hmm. private developers will be also open to using bamboo as part of uh, the house construction. See you, both. So thank you so much for that, Paul. So I think we have time for one more question for this section. So um, I think we also have a question here from May of Philstar. Um, is the sponge city concept applicable to Metro Manila? Uh, would any of our speakers like to answer this? Or, oh, sir, yeah, yeah. go ahead. I just, I just spoke about it in the Senate hearing last Wednesday. Sponge cities, that's part of green infrastructure where you absorb the, harvest the rainwater you can use it for irrigation, fire protection, and so on. And you, if you have excess uh, harvested uh, rainwater, you can release it after the floods. It's, it's being done in many cities in, in India and China right now. All right. Well, thank you so much for that, Architect Palafox. So that about wraps up our first section. If ever there are some wonderful questions here, if we have time, then we'll also ask them later on. So for a, sec for a third section, pala, um, before moving on to our third section, we wanted the audience to send in their answers again to the following question through the chat. So please now address it to everyone so everyone can see your answers. So this next question is, complete the following sentence, because I have a decent place to live, blank. So please just send in your answers to this question. Safety, a safe and secure place. I see you. I feel grateful. I feel that as well. Because I have a decent place to live, I can progress. That's a wonderful answer. Thank you so much, Jason. So there. So we all have wonderful answers for this. And this will actually be the question that kicks us off to our next section, which is on community development, education, and empowerment. So please remember, once again, if you have any questions for this section, address them to the questions co-host on Zoom or to the Facebook comments so that they can be sent over to me. So for our next question, we wanted to ask our speakers, how does housing affect the identity or culture of a group of people? Yeah, I have to keep on going back to my experience. See, in Disciplina Village, we're talking about moving people from various stretches of the Tuliahan River, our main tributary. Uh, the secondary tributary will be my Kawayan River. So they don't know each other. We're talking about 10,000 families who come from different segments of the city with their different barangay culture, with their different community culture. Um, so when we move them to an integrated housing where you're going to jam them all into a community, it can be very dangerous. They have their own groups or cliques already. Um, so 
uh, in Disciplina Village, what we came up one with was when before you move in, we give you this handbook. Uh, again, that will pretty much erase whatever notion you have of who you are, but rather with one simple goal. I am a responsible homeowner and I will strive to be a good neighbor. So that's why we came up with that handbook. And they attend a series of reorientations or seminars that will turn them into informal settlers from informal settlers to responsible homeowners. Now, um, the funny part about Disciplina Village, which is Akolatilia there is, over a cup, one year, you will get citations if you keep on violating these basic tenements of being a responsible homeowner. These are basic ones. Like you can't drink outside your house. You can't be running around naked. You can't do uh, things that you normally won't see in subdivisions. Uh, if you keep on getting citations, can come quarterly, the Disciplina Village Council, which is ran by the Homeowners Association together with the local government, will deliberate on your demerits and end up evicting you in the end if you keep on violating. But from our track record, we've only evicted less than a dozen families. These are the ones that really refuse to follow. So meaning people there know that their identity now should not be the siga sa tabi ng ilog, but rather a responsible homeowner. Kasi dati ata in the tabi ng ilog, it seems, uh, it seems that he can uh, get away with a lot of things. Walang batas eh. Uh, but here inside, when rules are set forth early on, when handbook is given, when you are attending seminars, then you understand your responsibility to the greater community that uh, I am a responsible homeowner, I will be a good neighbor. Okay, that's, that's a wonderful thought. Oh, um, uh, Dr. Rosales, go for it. Yes, let me, uh, I, I really like uh, the mayor's uh, concept, but let me, let me give you an, a variation on the importance of estate management, which is essentially, you know, how do you manage a large uh, settlement of people, right? Uh, in his case, he was taking people who needed who, who had to get away from the danger zones and so on. It was a local government project, very good. The ones I know more are the ones where people have been fighting for security of tenure for years, resisting relocation because they know what happens there. And there are cases, and we have many now in Metro Manila, where they fought to stay, uh, again, nonviolently, but through pressures and negotiating with government and help, technical help from NGOs and you know, different people who could assist in, them in preparing the papers that they need. Anyway, this, let me give you the case of Apo Am, which is a people's organization in uh, Mangahan floodway of Pasig City. They were all along the, the Pasig River there, or the, 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 the huge stretch there. And, um, you know, we're all going to be evicted. So what, because they were, or, they got organized, an NGO uh, organized them to really get strong about working out ways in which they would negotiate with the government, okay? So the, one of the first things they did was they, government said, the only place available is far, is in, uh, distant places. They said, but you know, they looked around their own area of Pasig and they saw this huge, what uh, architect Palapox has pointed out, there are large government owned open or spaces unused. And they found it was an MMDA area, which was used as a storage for their equipment. And, and so they said to NHA, you know, because they wanted to get NHA to support the housing, uh, why can't you buy that? Or why can't you arrange that we could move there? It's almost across the street from the river uh, in along the shores of Pasig City. After a long process of back and forth, NHA did organize that with uh, MMDA, which did allocate. So that's another whole, the whole bureaucratic process there. Bureaucracy in a good sense, you know, how you arrange that on those levels is already a huge problem because it's, it's something new for them. But in any case, after I think eight years, finally, um, the people got the right to have that. They, they um, said they would choose who should be the who should be the developer. Of course, NHA had to agree, but they initiated every step of you know, what's the next thing that you do that way? What's that? From the president's, the former president's uh, 50 billion account, I think, 
was allocated for that housing. So over the, the construction was designed, they were part of the process of looking at the design, fixing it and so on. So now they have moved into 10, I think four, three or four story buildings. There are several hundred of them and they are running it. They have now formed the homeowners association and they uh, are getting help from uh, NHA as well as NGOs uh, and others on how you manage this state. So they're the ones managing it and they're learning in the process, right? The local government is there, but they are, they figure the people are doing it pretty much on their own. They have some help. So they're, they're managing it because they're the ones who decide the rules after much consultation with people about, you know, are you, how long are you gonna turn on your TV? After 11 o'clock, it has to be a much lower volume. And people say, oh nga, no, hindi, dapat naman talaga ganon. So because they agree in a very consultative process, the community itself enforces the standards. And that becomes very important. So the new homeowners association, every block has you know, a set of officers that they've elected. And uh, so they're now moving into, for them, a very new area and has lots of problems because now, instead of demanding sort of from the government, they're demanding, you know, for themselves or people are saying, you know, making them accountable for what's happening. So just, just a long story, sir, that there is also the other model and of communities already organized, struggling to gain access to housing and when government provides that, and has happened, you know, in some cases, I can cite others, huh? The fact that people are the ones who then, as they say, informal set, informal set, homeowners, and then uh, finally, one last thing, when you said to some, uh, families. So what does it mean to you now that you have a place like an apartment, basically? And this woman said, you know, I feel safe. I can relax now after years of struggling for a place that could be my own. Uh, now I'm happy. My family's here. So all the statements that your participants have been making as to what does a home mean, now they have it, right? So as, as I think architect, all, of the, all of our participants have said, Housing is a whole lot of other things. Many of them are intangible, qualitative, but crucial for the uh, material side of things, right? And we hope that policymakers will begin to understand this and including the range of possibilities which the panel here already shows. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, if ever, Paul, would it be all right that we move on to our next question, Pomena? If ever we have time at the end, we can go back to this. So thank you uh, also, Ms. Ariane and Ms. Paulette Liu, but we'll move on, Pomena, for now. So for our next question, we're asking, with the remote learning program currently being implemented, how do you think student housing affects their studies? So for here, uh, Ms. Paulette Liu, you wanted to share some thoughts? Yeah. The effect is huge, especially for the local income households, which prob previously didn't have any, spa any space for study. There are many forms of destructions, including noise from the household, from the neighbor, from the street. Oftentimes, the space for study is actually just a converted space for other purposes, like a dining table. In order for parents to help their children have an effective remote learning experience, they need to implement changes in their household routines, like time for television, time for work, time for study, time for helping, you know, household, doing household chores. So um, we need to help them manage the house to be able to be effective in teaching the kids while the kids are still doing remote learning at home. At Skills, we develop a homeschooling playbook to help the parents become effective in the remote learning of their children. The playbook includes detailed instructions on how to manage the time of the kids, as well includes dedicating conducive space for learning if you don't have any space at home. And that's my answer. All right, thank you so much, Po. So um, does anybody else want to share their thoughts on this? Well, if nobody else does, uh, let me. I was just at a workshop with the Save the Children and and uh, you know their partners. They had done a very interesting study on uh, families and education of children at home. Exactly this topic, 
And one of the things they're saying, because they want to develop a program to uh, help, right? Uh, with this remote learning, et cetera, or half-half. And what they found in the initial baseline survey was that of course the mother, you know, the caregivers, it's caregivers, but 95% are the mothers, right? Who actually have to help their kids or supervise their studying. Um, they found they were very insecure for many reasons. One is maybe the mother only made it to grade two in her life while her children are grade six, grade four, and grade three, all right? So she, she they know more than she does in terms of schooling. So she often feels very, um, what, insecure. And they sometimes say, Ma, you don't know anything. What is, you know, they begin to get very negative about it. So they are developing a program to try to include, you know, the children and the mothers and the father in this, how do we deal with this program at home? A very holistic plan for, for everybody to play a part. Uh, and so, it's not only the children huh, who have the problems of uh, not enough space, not enough internet connection, not enough uh, eBooks and so on, but also the caregivers, especially the ones who are doing the actual supervision in, in the educational training for now. Uh, of course, they feel very inadequate with uh, anything online. Huh? I mean, say, say, um, what they're very good is on their cell phones because you can do a lot on cell phone and you can do a lot of training on cell phones. And they're willing because they feel so desperately about you know, being able to help their children. So this is a very important time in that field. Thank you for Dr. Rosales. Um, okay, uh, uh, Mr. Palafox, may you please share your thoughts? And then after that, we'll move on there in Yeah, Yeah, thank you. I, I, I agree with uh, Dr. Rosales on, on all of this. We have, uh, I'm helping the Universal Peace Foundation headquartered in Washington, DC and, and Seoul, Korea. Uh, the poorest barangays in the Philippines are providing solar lamps. So we have, we have even neighbors, some students, or they, they study together using the same solar lamp. And so the, their grades went up and the birth rate went down. So there's more social inter interaction and so on. The solar lamps in the poorest barangays where they are not in the power grid. And, and, uh, and also maybe this is... Uh, just to say something about the, what the, the Milch you said, incremental approach to housing. We're doing a housing a community in Marawi, funded by movie stars. And we have a complete design for the houses, for community, uh, place to shop and, 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 and worship. And we have a full design for the whole house, but they only build the ground floor. The second floor, they will build it themselves. So equity from the beneficiaries. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much for that, Architect Father Fox. That's, that's very interesting. I didn't know that also. So thank you so much for that, Paul. So now we will be moving on to our fourth section. But before we start this section, we wanted the audience to again answer the following question and send in their answers to the chat with everyone. So please address your answer again to everyone and answer this question. How do you describe a safe, decent home? So for our Facebook Live audience, please feel free to just comment whether you may have questions or you may want to answer this as well. So it, how would you describe a safe, decent home? I see we have love. Must be located in a safe piece of home. That's true as well. Full of care. That's true. Far from danger zones. That's very true. That's very true, Paul. Thank you. So thank you to our audience for answering that question. So for our fourth section, we will be tackling questions on the overall impact in housing. So once again, if the audience has questions, please address this to the questions co-host. Or if you're watching through Facebook Live, please just comment it. So um, the question that we wanted to ask here, which a lot of our registered participants actually asked us in different ways, was how can we properly communicate the housing issue to others? And why should people care about this housing issue, especially with the youth? So would anyone want to start us off? Oh, Ms. Ariana Ligayu, go ahead. Bro. I think for the Philippines, no, it's not hard to... Um 
inform people about the issue of poverty housing because when we look around us, it's just, you know, in front of our face. So I think everyone should be very, um, what do you call this, uh, sensitive to our surrounding to see that a lot of people are living in poor condition and that a lot of our Filipino countrymen needs decent and affordable housing. And then when in the news, we see a lot of, you know, um, every time we have disasters, typhoon, flooding, we see in the news a lot of families where their houses are, you know, um, destroyed by, by disaster and calamities. So I don't think it's hard for us you know, to um, inform people or tell people about the issue of poverty housing in our country. All right, thank you so much, Po. Oh, uh, Dr. Rosales, please go ahead, Po. Oh, you're muted, Po. Yeah, people can see it if you pass by there after a disaster, but people may see, but doesn't mean they really see, right? See in the sense of understanding and connecting with that. Uh, and that's what we see. And, and of course, informal settlements are often hidden, you know, behind where, where people don't go. Let me just say that um, this is an example. The DPWH about five years ago before this, this presidency um, asked us, a group of us social scientists, if we could help them talk to their own engineers about urban poor groups in communities because they were so uh, angry about you know going to clear the roads to build something and their houses where people are ready to, to throw stones at them, feces, whatever. And th then you get a, a fight, right? The police come in, there's a battle. So the head of the, the head of the uh, DBH team said, can you explain to them why are people, why do people want to stay where they are when they could move to better housing, all right? Offsite, we know the answer to that, but at that time they didn't really. And so we said, you know, we can give lectures from Nil now to tomorrow and maybe we change a few minds, but let us arrange for these engineers just to talk to some of the organized communities who have been struggling to gain access to secure tenure and then housing. And those have been organized by different NGO groups and so on. So we took them to very five, four places. One of them was in Apoam, where the community had already you know, moved there. Uh, Stare de San Miguel, where there has now been housing that's gone up through years of struggle. Uh, another one in Quezon City, um, I've forgotten the name at the moment. Anyway, and, and we said to the people, you know, these DPWH people are coming to see you. They want to know why do you not want to move away from that, those circumstances? So they organized an explanation. They had a dialogue. And we said to the engineers, just listen to them for the first day, morning, listen to them, their views. And then in the afternoon, go around, they take you around, start asking them questions. So at the end of the day, there was really a dialogue. And the next day, they came back to the sort of classroom at DPWH. And we got feedback and the engineer said, you know, we said, anyway, what it turned out, the major discovery was, you know, like they're us, like us, they're really families. They're really struggling just to make a way in the city, find a way to their kids, send their kids to school. They're not really different from us. So of course, you know, the initial idea, those are terrible people, they're against the law and so on. They begin to see them as human beings who had certain problems that they could understand. And so, you know, from that time on, well, I, I don't know how much it changed the whole TWH, but for those 65 engineers who discovered that by talking to people, listening to them, and then seeing that, okay, these are things you cannot change. You know, th if there's a technology, you cannot do that because you need strength and da, da, da. And, and so a negotiation became possible because trust had been built up. And that is a really a main issue in government, especially at community levels. They have to trust the people who are talking to them, that they listen to them and really come out with some solutions that respond to what now they call the people's plan, right? Uh, which is kind of well organized for discussion. So I think that that's something that should be definitely you know, brought into this picture. 
All right, thank you so much, Dr. Rosales. Um, all right, we have architect Paula Fox. So, so go ahead, Paul, share your thoughts. Yes, one is, uh, if I may, if I may share, when my children were very young, we live in a gated community. I brought them to Smoky Mountain to spend Christmas. So it really, until now, they remember that. And, and also during the, after the big flooding and landslide in Infanta Real Quezon, I, we rented a bus with my children again and my young architects, planners and designers. We went there and helped them, give them groceries and help them clean their homes full of mud and so on. Then we designed homes for them and, and the Dharma master founder of Chuchi, only two bedrooms, he asked me, would you put your family there? So I had to redesign the homes for the victims of this landslide. And housing is one of the biggest multiplier in the industry. They create jobs and the beneficiaries, they can have sweat equity. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that, Mr. Uh, architect Palafox, that was wonderful. So now we have another question. This was actually the most asked question in our registration form, asked in many different ways. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Aligayu, would it be all right, Paul, that we um, move on to this, Paul? Or um, would you like to share your thoughts now, Paul, for a, a quick while? Very quick. Uh, let's say in Habitat, no? when we engage people, we don't only ask them to give donations so that we have funds to build houses. There are other ways to engage our volunteers. We usually invite them to go to the site, build with our home partners, build their houses so, th so that they get you know, the whole picture of how these people that they are helping really lives on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. All right, thank you so much, Ms. Alegayu. That's wonderful as well. So moving on again, this is um, our most asked question on our registration form, asked in many different ways. In our own way, how can individuals, especially the youth, help in forwarding the housing advocacy, especially during this time of COVID-19, wherein there are a lot of other factors that may restrict you from doing your usual activities? So would anyone like to start us off here? You know, can you repeat that? You, uh, oh. Your very louder voice, please. Uh, yes, Paul, yes, Paul. Um, the question is, in our own way, how can individuals, especially the youth, help in forwarding the housing advocacy, especially during this time of COVID-19 when there are a lot of factors at play that might resist you from doing normal activities? Uh, Ms. Liu, go ahead. Bro. Oh, you're muted, Po, sorry. Okay, the youth are digital natives, okay, with digital transformation. I think they can do a lot. The youth can use social media to advocate and spark public awareness on the country's housing backlog. The youth can start conversations and movements to influence the drivers of the low-cost housing market, such as the government, private sector, and the future homeowners themselves. The youth could also advocate wider use of digital financial applications and infrastructures to encourage financial literacy and encourage the habit of savings. The youth can also in, get involved in different housing organizations, just like Habitat for Humanity. All right, thank you so much, Bo. Uh, Dr. Rosales, you also wanted to share some thoughts on this? Yeah, mainly because, you know, I was teaching, oh, I, am, I am teaching a class at the Ateneo of juniors and part of the Ateneo orientation is that they have to go and meet with communities. Now, given online, they can't go out anymore. So we're challenged, uh, how do you do that online? Anyway, we connected with, let's in, take two communities that I know uh, and my colleague also knew, Melissa Navarro. One was the Manila North Cemetery group. These are people who live in the cemetery, okay? And another one was a group in Mandaluyong where we connected with the Unang Hakbang Foundation, which works with the young people there um, and so on. So uh, these were social science students. So we said, we're trying to get them to listen to what people say about their lives. And if you want to help them find out what is it they need that you can support. So that was part of the process. So we arranged, uh, the school arranges that the communities talk to us, to the, they talk to each other online. The young people talk to them online. And then my students, 
design a, in some cases, a, survey, a research instrument that um, they also answering questions that they raise. In the case of Unakakbang, it was early teenage pregnancy. I mean, the young people are, you know, they're much involved with that. And these are 11, 12 year olds to 15 year old girls usually who are pregnant. And you know, how, what is that? So how are we gonna address that? So to get, what's the basic information you need? Talk to the teenagers, talk to the mothers, talk to the mothers who were teenage pregnant at 14. What have their lives become, how is, et cetera, et cetera. So based on that, my students in social science designed a study which is being participated in. They can't go there, you see. So they always have to talk to the local community people, the young people to say, can you ask these questions? And then there's an interaction. So, I mean, better if they could go there, but they cannot, but at least there, I know then at the end of the semester, um, the quarter, which we just had, I asked them to write a paper based on their experience and to write what I call an advocacy paper. I said, present that you are going to write an article for the Inquirer or Rappler about um, these young children and what is it they need. So they wrote wonderful graphics and videos. They were very creative, but they really felt the issue because they had talked to the people, the young people and listened. So that what I'm saying is that's one way, even online, it has to be organized. You know, young people can't just invent the con connection. You have to connect with those who are, who know the community. In many cases, NGOs, people's organizations that you already know, the church groups, but to facilitate the connection between you know, students who make it to college and those who are in communities with less ability or less um, advantages, but where you can kind of bring them together. Right? And that understanding is crucial because then the urban poor kids don't think as rich people, oh, you don't care about us, you know, you're just you. And they discover that there are rich kids who do care about them and wanna help in ways that are responsive to what they themselves, the urban poor young people, feel they need. Right? That's it. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Resellis. So, uh, Mr. Palafox, may you please share some of your quick thoughts and then we'll move on to our next question. Go ahead, Paul. Oh, uh, Mr. Mr. Palafox. Yes. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, just to share again, during this pandemic, this is what I call tactical urbanism or guerrilla urbanism. We can do quick fix and so on, like uh, the youth can, can clean the stairs, plant, 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 instead of build, build, build. And they could identify now the clean of their neighborhood. They can, uh, they can help in widening the sidewalks, plant there, and, and look at public sanitation, clean water, all the deficit to the, and clean, clean toilets, and so on. And maybe me, uh, architecture students and engineering students, maybe faculty members should teach them to do architecture for humanity, patriotic architecture, architecture for the poor, philanthropic architecture, because mo most of the design problems in uh, architecture schools is, again, architecture to those who can afford to pay. And, and many companies, they have a CSR budget. So if we identify all of them, and one of them are homeless street children. There are so many of them, and, and maybe we can help that. And there are so much uh, vacant land. So maybe urban agriculture, kitchen gardens, vertical kitchen gardens for the poor housing. And instead of just build back better, it should be build back better, verde. So plant, plant, plant. It's not just build, build, build. All right, um, Ms. Ariane, if you would like to share some quick thoughts lang po, and then we'll... Oh, Very quickly okay. lang, no, because uh, as you mentioned earlier, no, this year is a 10th year uh, celebration of the Habitat Young Leaders Build, where in Habitat would engage young people in the work of Habitat. So an exa a concrete example how, on how do we engage young people. This, the, Rita, basically this is you know, the webinar that you organize, that the campus chapter organized. This is one way of uh, discussing about the issues of poverty housing in the country and maybe come up with solutions that we could uh, recommend to maybe private sector in, and even the government. But at the same time, um, you know, just use your uh, know-how in terms of the use of technology uh, one of your campus chapter actually uh, shared that they wanted to 
do an online storytelling for uh, the children talk about the issue of poverty housing by using like the three pigs, you know, this, the children's story about the three pigs. So I think those innovative ideas so that we can um, share uh, ideas and uh, issues to the greater uh, public would be good. Yay, thank you so much, Ms. Aligayu. So um, that about finishes our fourth section. And now our panel discussion is coming to a close. So for our final section, we wanted to ask our speakers to share some thoughts on this question. Why is it important for various sectors to work together and advocate for housing? So would any of our speakers like to start? Yes. Uh, Mayor Rex Gachalian, go ahead. Well, I guess uh, first thank you for uh, having us or having me into, uh, brought into this webinar. Um, uh, the other speakers already said it. The problem of housing is skin, skin deep. It's so vast. It's emotional. It's multifaceted. It's three dimen more than three-dimensional. And a single person or a single entity won't be able to move it. Uh, you really need a systemic approach where all the gears and all the cogs are moving all at the same time. And then that's, in that way, we can really move forward. Um, the local government can do it alone. The national government can do it alone. There has to be a collective effort and we have to make a systemic, uh, conscious systemic decision to, to solve this problem. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, uh, um, Mayor Rex. Um, we're moving on to Architect Palafox. Oh, just before you answer, Paul, I'm sorry for our participants. You've sent such wonderful questions, but we really don't have time to ask all of them. So we've really just picked a few, but thank you so much for all those questions. And we have had a wonderful discussion. So Architect Palafox, please go on, Paul. Yeah, if I may, housing is not just shelter. It's complete community. That's like what I shared a, a while ago. And uh, uh, sustainable development goals number 11 of the United Nations, inclusivity, cost or affordability, uh, resilient, resilient and sustainable. And I think strong leadership is uh, just like Mayor Gatchalian. I've done work in 40 countries and the more successful leaders, they, they have visionary leadership, strong political will, good appreciation, good urban planning, good appreciation of design, like architecture, engineering, and good governance. And the leaders should be the exemplars, not the ex exempted. I hope Mayor Katsalian can influence the 1,600 mayors. Thank you. And I would like to make one last, one last point <laughs> Go also. Ahead. Go ahead, <laughs> yeah. Dr. Salas. I'm really glad that Mayor Katsalian was here because uh, the LGU role is, I think, extremely important. If I've been in this business, quote unquote, for 50 years, and because we were in Metro Manila, we were always dealing with the national government. That has lots of problems. It, the, the bureaucracies are very complex, uh, even on local national land. But what we have found over the years is when local government then takes an interest that, that it's their problem, they begin to find solutions. The difference is, that as mayor and Victoria knows, that local governments are elected by the people in the community. On the national government, it's all very vague, but accountability of local government is there, especially the good local governments, the good leaders like the mayor. So I think our model has to move, has also to think specifically of how can local governments uh, who have to respond to very different sets of persons who need, uh, respond and listen, and they're more willing to listen to their own people because they know that they have to have an election and they hope to get reelected. So I, I think we have to shift from this model of always dealing with NHA, although we know that's important, but let's focus on the strengths of local government and support those efforts, including barangay level and community-based organizations uh, who are very significant. And let me last say, it's the women in urban informal settlements. It's the women who get organized and really push hard. It, partly because I think local government officials don't get so upset if they get very strong because so, women know how to back off when they need to. They know how to manipulate people, including leaders. So they're very good at negotiating, much more than the typical male, I have to say. 
uh, quickly, as one woman told me, I said, why is that the case? She said, you know, if I tell my husband to buy something in the market and I give him 20 pesos and the market vendor says it's, it costs 20 pesos, agad agad, lalabas yung 20 pesos. Aba, ako? If I go to the market? No, no, we negotiate. She said, women know how to negotiate. And that's why, of course, they're always there and they are the strong leaders and we have to recognize that. Not that the men should not be involved. They usually know when to bring in the men because they're doing other things. But the strengths of communities are very much women in this country. All right, thank you, Dr. Rosales. Um, actually, I think we might be a bit out of time, but Ms. Liu, you also wanted to share some thoughts on this. Go ahead, Paul. Oh, are you muted, Paul? Uh, first of all, thank you, Habitat, for this opportunity. And Mayor Rex, thank you. You're such an inspiration to all. And I hope the other LGUs will follow you, other mayors will follow you. See, the housing backlog is really very huge. And this will only worsen as the country gets more inundated by typhoons and floods. However, the housing problem is so huge that it can't be entrusted solely to the government. We, the private sector, has to get more involved. In as much as we are involved and the private sector has steadily addressed the housing market, data shows that the low cost housing market where the gaps occur is still largely not being taken care of. Okay, the private sector needs to invest here while the government provides enabling environment and legislation and incentives for the low cost housing market to flourish. There's also another angle that I want to, I want to show to everyone. You may have the lot, you may have the materials, but if you don't have the people to work on these houses, it will be another problem. There is also a need for our families, academic institutions, and private companies to look at skilled construction work in a more professional light. Gone are the days when a construction professional is looked down upon because, it is because of the three Ds, dirty, difficult, and dangerous, low paid and futureless profession. Today, the labor gap in the construction industry is huge though their skills are very valuable here and abroad. So construction companies are also willing to pay higher salaries for skilled professionals. So as we encourage the youth to look at uh, construction skills, as skills that are valued in our economy, we should also look and encourage the people to get into industrial arts, into putting more value in the construction and skilled workers. By doing so, we're also helping the housing industry grow as well. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Ms. Liu. Um, Ms. Ariane, um, if you can just also share for you quick thoughts and go ahead. Um, yeah, um, you know, I agree with what me, uh, Professor Mary said about, you know, the, the example of Valenzuela, the discipline of village. It's, it's not a one, you know, it's not a one answer for all the situations that we have in the country. So, Valenzuela's example is one that we could look at or the other LGUs can look at. But then there are also other examples, good examples from other LGUs that maybe all the mayors will have to look at and see you know, what would be the context that they could um, implement in their locality. But what's really needed is the political will of our local leaders so that you know, the issue of poverty housing in their locality can be addressed. May it be an on-site relocation, in-city relocation, or as what uh, Professor Mary um, gave an example earlier about, you know, the organized um, people's organization wanting to uh, build their houses in the area or in the lot that they already uh, lived in. So there are a lot of options, uh, but what we need to do is come up with the different interventions for the different level of um, income for the household and the different situation of our families in need of housing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul. So that about ends our panel discussion. Thank you so much for all our speakers. We really wish that we had more time for this, but I feel like this really shows the wide discussion on housing, that there's just so much that you want to talk about. There's so much that you want to share because this is such an interesting and wonderful topic, especially when it comes to the housing advocacy. So we'll be moving on to our next section. Um, I mean, to our next part, but, um, if it would be all right, I'll, I can pass through all of the speakers if you can just give a last message. But um, I request for that this can be like a quick last message, perhaps just for a one-liner if you can. And then we'll move on Napo and end our panel discussion. So we can start here with Miss Ariana Ligayu for your quick last message for final words. Well, I have no more to say, but just to say thank you to the organizer of this webinar. Uh, I hope that you know we'll able to reach out to more young people to know more about the issue of 
um, housing, you know, in our country and uh, to get them, you know, get involved in any cause that they would like to be involved in. Thank you, Bob. All right. Um, may we now ask Ms. Paulette Liu to share just some quick final words. It's just a brief one. I just want to say thank you and uh, for the youth, get involved. In your own little way, you can always make a difference and a positive impact to the lives of the people. And by getting involved, you will put hope, bring hope to these families as well. Thank you so much, Ms. Liu. Um, Architect Paolo Fox, would you like to share some quick final thoughts? Yes, please. Uh, by 2050, with 40 to, uh, 40 to 50 million more Filipinos, we'll need about 100 new towns and 50 new cities. And I hope they will be planned very well and include, be inclusive, include the poor, and so on. And, and there are also others I wanted to have shared, but uh, there's more time. Uh, Rotary, Club, Rotary Clubs, uh, like I remember Rotary Club uh, Alabang, we have a Jablo village for ex-convicts of Montilupa. Again, livelihood, housing, and so on. And we changed the name to Puruk Jablo to Puruk Paraiso. And then now I'm Rotary Club Makanti. We're helping housing for the poor in Paranaque and Montilupa. And the, the main organizations like uh, what Professor Rasile said can be involved here. Thank you. Okay, thank you for um, Dr. Rosales. Any quick final words? Yeah, I think we must really have make a big dent in the policy dimension and legislation. I mean that this saw the, the, the number of people without housing, especially among the urban poor informal settlers, has to be addressed and they have to give attention to it. The housing budget, I think, is one percent. You know, one of the lowest in Asia, maybe the in Southeast Asia anyway, that's un unacceptable considering and the COVID has shown us. So uh, we need alliances and maybe you know with the people who are here with the private developers uh, we can begin an alliance of people from different parts of the society who are concerned to solve the problem you need many portions to address it but it, but only if we begin to come together and finally i'd say we have to take another look at the private developers we've always been focusing on government private developers, some are very good, some are terrible in terms of massive dislocation, reclamation with very little concern for what happens to the people that get bumped off and, you know, and so on. I think um, that kind of massive destructive development which does not take people into concern, uh, in, including some of them in the build, 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 uh, that, let us address that. There are solutions, but we need both the people on the ground, the NGOs, civil society, academics, uh, you know, people like yourselves, government, and so on. Many people have to focus on this. We need to make a difference in the next 10 years at least. Thank you so much, Dr. Rosales. And finally, Mayor Rex Gatchalian, if you would like to share some final Well, questions. first off, thank you for having me. Uh, number two, I personally learned a lot from the co-panelists and I will probably be reaching out to each and every one of them because there's so much to learn from all of them that we can uh, incorporate in our Valenzuela master plans. And number three, I guess for all the uh, kids who are kids or the students who are watching, um, housing is everybody's concern. Get involved, whether it's digitally or get moving through organizations like Habitat for Humanity, the important thing is you get involved. Yeah, thank you so much, Mayor Rex Kachalian, and thank you so much for all our panelists for that amazing discussion. I feel personally that I learned so much. I feel that our audience learned so much, and I feel that this was just an amazing experience. Thank you, Paul, to all of you. So that thank concludes you. Thank our you. panel. Oh, thank you, Rinpo. So that concludes our panel discussion for today. We hope that everyone was able to inquire, acquire insights on housing and the importance of housing and focusy. In order to wrap up today's event, we will be having our closing speech given by Ms. Kichidi. She is the president of the Habitat for Humanity Blue Chapter. As a fellow youth member and legacy builder, she will be sharing some of her experiences on being a youth leader and on the steps we can take in continuing our focusy. And thank you, Rita, for that introduction. I, for one, also great, lear learned a great load of insight from each of our speakers today. Change. It all ask ourselves is what do we do now with all that we have learned today? Learn
housing doesn't stop here. We can among those within our reach, not only of the importance of decent housing, but of the complexity of the issue. In high school, where I would participate in programs of painting classrooms, packing relief goods, and teaching public school students, to name a few. Print One way or another, I realized my privilege, but more than that, I realized my capacity to be a part of national development and structural change. Both younger and older generations alike are mobilizing themselves and their communities to serve human, especially at this time of a global pandemic and, in, and occurrences of natural disasters. And nowadays, we are given greater opportunities to support different advocacies and are contributing to a fundraising. They're not. And access to information about the housing issue and injustices being faced by the housing sector today. To learn from five credible speakers and on behalf of Habitat Philippines and the campus chapters, we are continue providing information to raise the importance of decent housing through our respective platforms. We need to create both tangible and intangible change in this world. And there are so many problems I believe we can solve if we work together. The is so strong, but it isn't only our generation that has to work towards a better world. By working hand in hand with academics, professionals, and experts, such as the privilege of learning from today, as a community, we can receive was that of being the current president of an organization that advocates for decent shelter. It allowed me to understand the complexity of the issue and has provided me with an avenue to encourage others to do um, housing issue. Uh, Kitchi, your audio keeps on cutting off. I'm sorry. How is it now? Uh, I, I think I can hear it now. Okay. Uh, try to go on then. Oh, sorry, it's cutting off again. Um, <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. Just keep on. Uh, let's see if it works again. Understanding of the housing issue that we can effectively work towards meeting our vision. Raise my voice for those that struggle to be heard. Not only this, but I am surrounded by inspiring people on a regular basis who give me hope in a better and brighter future. I found that there are so many ways to serve the advocacy of housing. I work with Dana and Mihari who that channel their love for creativity, alongside Alexis who channels her love for research and writing into educational content for our members and the general public. I work with Regina, Jondi, and Zed, who have collectively channeled their entrepreneurial spirit and fund management skills into organizing fundraising efforts to support our communities and advocacy. The Habitat community, as we all continue to participate in this mission in our own ways, both big and small. Moving forward, I challenge each of you to serve the advocacy of housing one way or another. With our current situation, we won't be able to the importance of decent and sustainable housing goes up. All be season, we would encourage everyone, especially our fellow youth, to build your legacy of impact and together let's become advocates and change makers for decent housing. I'll be since 2012. We see powering through housing. 
participate in organizing activities that aim to empower. And in collaboration with the Habitat Philippines campus chapters, we have organized a fundraiser to support elementary and high school students of seven different communities. For some of them to continue with their schooling, is the importance of education and our capacity to help our fellow youth. We to provide school supply kits to these students. About our initiative and make a contribution, you can head over to bit.ly slash bigaybukas. Every contribution counts now more than ever. All right. And the concrete. And there are so many great things that arise when one is able to live in a decent home. But for today, I would once again like to encourage each of you to use the capacity you have in being a part of positive change and making sustainable impact. Actions can make all the difference, and as a community striving towards a better world, I know that through hard work, dedication, and collaboration, we can reach that vision of a world where everyone has a decent place to live in. Thank you. Thank you as well so much, Kitchi. Um, thank you for that. So just to reiterate something that Kitchi was saying, um, this program, this webinar, also aims to um, advertise Bigay Bukas which is a project under the Habitat for Humanity Philippines campus chapters, wherein we aim to give school supplies to children who have a hard time adjusting because of the current pandemic, so to help them with their distance learning. So we want to encourage our audience, if anyone um, would like to help us out in this project to donate or just to learn more, please feel free to go to bit.ly that's a big eye book us, so that you can learn more about this project and maybe also give us your support. So, um, so thank you so much for that talk, Kitchi. And finally, thank you to all of our participants as well. So on the screen, you will also see the bit.ly for Big Eye Bukas, if ever any of you are interested in checking it out. So to all our participants, thank you so much for joining us today for this webinar. Uh, we'll be sending all our registered participants a post-event evaluation form to answer so that you can tell us your thoughts on this forum. You can also indicate through there if you would like to receive a certificate of attendance. For our unregistered participants from Facebook Live, you may also send us an email at habitatphcampuschapters at gmail.com if ever you would wish to receive a certificate of attendance. We'll be then asking you to answer the evaluation form as well. So thank you everyone. Let's continue building a world where everyone has a decent place to live. And on behalf of the Habitat for Humanity Philippines Campus Chapters, Thank you again to everyone for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much for all our participants and thank you so much to all our speakers and for everyone.